Hey, this is Corey with Peak Sports Performance, and this is Outside the Box. All right, so I'm here with Josh Crouch, who is a, a minor league baseball player from the Detroit Tigers, who is working out in the facility and has been home in Sebring, Florida in the offseason. And we talked about having a conversation about some of the things that are going on in baseball, some of the important topics that I think we both wish that we knew more about when we were younger and going through all the different steps of trying to achieve our dream of going to college and beyond. Um, some of the topics that we're going to talk about today, I think, are very important for some of the parents that we have in the Highlands County area. And so, you know, we wanted to talk through some of this stuff as a conversation and then also hopefully give you guys some answers as to uh, what you should be doing. Because unfortunately, a lot of this stuff is not readily available. And unless you have someone like Josh uh, who's gone through it and, you know, is still currently playing, can give you that information, it's, it would be really hard to find that otherwise. So, um, Josh, thanks for doing this. Yeah. This is really cool. I'm glad we finally get a chance to sit down and actually cover some of this material. Um, first thing I want to talk about is youth baseball, because, you know, right now there's there's been a big shift into travel ball. And, you know, growing up, we both had an opportunity to play rec ball. And, you know, it just seems to be suffering because of that. Start, it's starting to get less and less. And so it seems like there's a travel ball team like on every corner. There's multiple levels of teams on every organization. And a lot of parents are, are not really sure where they should go with it. I think they, they're having a hard time on choosing what's best for their kid. Um, what are your thoughts on travel ball versus rec ball? And is there a place for them to both exist? Yeah, I mean, I tell people that I talk to throughout the community sometimes, I don't really have a preference whether it's travel ball or rec ball. The thing is, it's important that you're playing for a quality team and getting quality instruction. And then on top of that, are you having someone that is going to manage your workload or are you just going to play seven, eight games a weekend and the catcher is out there catching all seven games and the pitcher's thrown you know, four times during the weekend and they've thrown 180 pitches? Um, I think it's important that you are around people that know the game, understand the game, understand that it is not about wins and losses at 10U to 14U travel ball. It's about the development of the player and getting ready for the high school levels. If you're with a quality travel team, I'm okay with that 100%, but the other thing you need to differentiate is the fact that there is a time of year for playing baseball and there is a time of year for training to be an athlete and training as a baseball player or playing another sport if that is what you do um, because being a baseball player and just doing baseball does not mean you're going to be a better athlete you need to start training like an athlete playing other sports because it will all translate to the baseball field so yeah that's a good answer and i, I think that that's the thing that's missing from a lot of people is they they're, the message out there is that you should play more if you want to get better at the game and i think that you know for me that's one of the red flags about some of the travel orgs that we're looking at is that if they're promising that you're going to get better and you're going to develop into the player that you're supposed to be, but the only answer they're giving you is games, that to me is like the biggest red flag. So let's talk about a big buzzword in travel baseball, and that's development. I hear it a lot. Uh, I've made a few posts myself and tweets about that. I see travel organizations who are just showing up to play baseball who are saying they're developing kids. And you and I know that that leaves a lot uh, to be undesired or a lot to be desired. They kind of just roll the ball out and then they say, hey, we're going to play and that's going to help you get to where you want to go. So let's let's go. Some of the guys even practice and they hit 50 ground balls. They throw three rounds of BP, take it to the house, and that's supposed to get you better at baseball. Right. Uh, with your experience in pro ball, you went to a division one school. You, you went through the whole thing that everybody wants to achieve and wants to go through. How do you define development and uh, how can a, a travel ball coach or a high school coach who maybe is struggling to, to figure out what that is, how can they actually, like, how can you lay out a good definition for development? Yeah. For me, I've had, the, I've had the, this off season, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of kids over in, um, in the Wachula area and a couple teams out there. And I, what I've found is that development comes when you make practice game-like. When you're making practice, as hard, if not harder than the game with a cost, you know, reward. 
yeah, uh, yeah. aspect to it. So in working with those people, making everything a conversation, co excuse me, a competition um, has has allowed for kids to get better because they know that they need to pay attention to the details, like I said earlier, because they know that they need to, you know, have some type of whether it's putting kids into groups and making everything a competition, or it's like, hey, whoever has the most barrels in this round doesn't have, uh, you know, doesn't have push-ups or doesn't have sprints at the end. It's always something, you know, it can be fun, it can be completely fun, but there's something to be said to the competitive environment of, you know, developing a culture, developing a standard within a team. And I just think that should be the overall standard. It doesn't matter what level you play at, you know, we're not just rolling out to play a baseball game. We're rolling out to be better baseball players and get ready for games that actually matter. Mm -hmm. Because games do not matter when you're 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. Games don't really matter until you start getting into the high school ages. Yep. Um, freshman year, sophomore year, junior year of high school. Yep. Um, when colleges are actually interested in you. So you should be way more focused on is my kid playing the game correctly? Is my kid running the way he needs to be? Is my kid treating his teammates the way that, the way that they need to be treated? Um, versus just looking at the scorecard and saying, you know, my kid went over four today. He had a terrible day. Yeah. Now, you know, that's just building. That's also why I feel like, because baseball is such a mental game, um, I, I feel like people are running from baseball for that because there's just a high expectation for success right. in a failure-based game. Yeah. And that is just, uh, you know, it's unfair to the kids. I, I, I feel like, to wrap that back in, I feel like the competition in practices breeds development. And I think that, I think that we were blessed growing up with really good coaches that made, especially on my travel teams growing up, um, that made the game that way for me. Uh, made everything competitive, made yeah. everything relays and, and, and agility after practice. And, and uh, it wasn't just, you know, show up, every, and show up and play. Like we're showing up to the field with a plan. This is what we're working on today. Do we know how to do, you know, defend first and third? Do we know how to defend bun defenses when the ball's hitting into the gap? Yeah. Where are we throwing the baseball, situational baseball? Um, you know, taking time to focus on the things that actually matter and that are going to get you to the next level. I think that there, there's a there's so much baseball getting played everywhere now that there's no barrier for entry to coach, and so they're letting the game coach the kids versus practice is the thing that you I, I would say is like doing your homework every day, and then you take a test at the maybe the end of the semester. Like that's what the game is supposed to be, and that right now it would be like going through school and only taking tests and not doing any homework at Correct. all and expecting to do well. Correct. So it, 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 like you said, bunt defense, um, backing up bases. I, I've seen a lot of really bad base running that I feel like can easily be coached, but you have to know what you're coaching and yep. you have to know the finer details. And so that brings me back to, there's a lot of high school kids who maybe were really good nine and 10 and 11 year olds, maybe the best, right? And what, is, what, what does it mean if you're the best nine year old right. around so, you know, what do you feel like as, as far as, like, if, if you're coaching a 9, 10, 11-year-old kid, um, you know, where would you want them to be so that they would get to the point where they're the best 15, 16, 17-year-olds? Oh, yeah. I think that at that age, again, we're focusing on, obviously, having fun at that age is, is a huge aspect of the game. So I think that's where, you know, engaging in a lot of competitive competitions among the team and stuff mm -hmm. like that is extremely important so kids don't get burnt out at a, at a young age of like, this is what we do for baseball and we're gonna come and just, you know, do the daily grind, daily grind, daily grind, daily grind and not relate it to the game whatsoever. Yep. Um, I, I, I think that that causes a lot of fizzle out. However, I think at a young age, kids need to be, kids need to be focused on learning how to control their bodies, being better athletes, and just from a young age, learning the baseball IQ, learning where they need to go, when, learning about, you know, how you need to act on the baseball field. There's a certain standard. You, you, yeah. you, you, don't, you, don't, uh, you don't see people acting this way on TV, so we shouldn't act this way at eight years old if that's how you're, if yeah, that's like how you're foreseeing bat yourself bat to see. Stuff. Yes, no pouting after at bats, throwing helmets into the, throwing helmets into the, uh, into the, the fencing area. Uh, just doesn't play. You, know, you need to start acting and playing like, uh, you know, you respect the game. That was always a big, a big thing when I was growing up. Um, our coaches would always say, you know, respect the game, respect the game, respect the game, but also, you know, 
the failure of the game for me is what always made me come back to the game. Mm -hmm. And then understanding that this is a failure based game. This is a, uh, the toughest, toughest sport in the world to play and, uh, understanding that failure is going to be a part of it and how you're going to deal with that mentally. Yeah. Um, it seems like the, like nine, 10 year olds that are in the middle of the pack, like those are the ones that I almost feel like yep. probably going to be the, you know, the better yeah. ones when they're older because yeah. they don't have enough success yet to feel like they've got it all figured out but they also aren't so disappointed with the failure of the game that they don't want to play anymore. So it's like, I almost, I almost would want my son or daughter to be kind of on a team that puts them in the middle of the pack versus I don't want them to be the best. Yep. I don't really want them to be the worst either because yep. I don't want them to be so upset that they never want to play anymore. Exactly. So it just, it seems like that's kind of like the, the right temperature to be at. If you are in your small town community and your son has always been the better player and he's always hitting three, four hole on a team and he has like a certain you know, or about him and a certain way that he acts and he thinks that he's the man. Well, guess what? Just because you're the man in your community doesn't mean you're the man in the state or the man in the country. Yep. Every city across the entire country has handfuls and handfuls and handfuls of those kids. So you need to be around competition that is much better than you, if not equal to your competition yep. all the time. So I want to go play for a team where I go and I hit fifth or I hit sixth. I'm not showing up to a team where I'm always instant the guy star, and the guy yeah. and the instant leadoff hitter and the instant, you know, I want to be able to develop the work ethic right. because that's what it's going to be. As I said earlier, the cream rises to the top and you're going to have to beat some people out in order to get to the top. So you developing that, you know, that push for success mentally is going to be developed by not necessarily getting spoon fed the best spot, all yeah. the at-bats all the time. There needs to be a little bit of conflict in there and you figure out, how you're going to go around and, you know, the work ethic that I'm going to have to be able to beat that guy out, beat that guy yeah. out, and beat that guy out. So I think that's, I think that's also, you know, very much important for kids not to be, because uh, I've, I've seen my entire life, you see, you go to a perfect game tournament and the kids that are blown up in high school, like he's ranked in, you know, in Florida oh, yeah, 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 and yeah, wherever yeah, yeah. in the country. Eight-year-old eight rankings. Eight yes, year old rankings. like they're, but also with me, like we're high school rankings. You see all the kids that yeah. used to be the man in high school and they just fizzle out. Right. They right. never hear about them again and now they're doing something else yeah. just because, you know, whether that was a mental thing, they never, being being punched in the mouth at a young age is, is very good by the game of baseball because it shows you how you're going to respond. And how am I, how am I in a game of failure, how am I going to respond to that failure? Because it's only going to get worse and worse yep. as the game goes on. So you learn that when you're... So learning and developing that gritty mentality uh, allows you to play with a, you know, with a different chip on your shoulder. You're a catcher. You didn't start that way. You started at a different position and basically had to learn a, one of the most difficult positions, if not the most difficult position in baseball. So with you developing so much defensively as a catcher, and last year ranking so high in minor league baseball and the catching metrics, it's great to get a, get your perspective on this because there's a few hot topics in catching. A lot of talk on Twitter. Um, local coaches here, I think, disagree on the way catching is because a lot of them weren't catchers. Like myself, I wasn't a catcher. I've had to learn from people like you. So why are more catchers, just basic question here, best answer you can. I know you get this a lot, but why are more catchers going to one knee down versus two knees and what do you say to coaches who are asking catchers to avoid one knee down yeah i would say that it is not in their best interest to just go to a traditional two knee up old school stance and more explore the, the realms of a one knee stance because number one it makes you more athletic number two you want to be in the best position that you can receive block and throw from and that is the one knee stance people you, you see it all the time on tv people are going to one knee it allows you to get underneath the ball to present it to the umpire better um, there are some people that are on tv that still are in the traditional style however you see them kyle Higashioka is a name that i think of that has traditionally been um, a traditional style catcher and now he's moving more towards the one knee i saw him in the playoffs this year he's moving towards more one knee um, you know, just because receiving is such a big part of the game nowadays, being able to, to steal strikes for your pitcher and turn 1-1 one, one counts into 1-2 counts, uh, you know, the offensive numbers go dramatically downward um, just by gaining one strike in the count. And I think as a catcher, you know, your number one priority should be to help out the pitcher and do anything you can on the mound for their success. So I think 
um, I turn that around and what is the best position I can be in to help the pitcher on the mound have the most success possible. Now on the flip side, I know people are gonna say, well, you see catchers miss balls all the time on one knee. Okay, yes, they do miss balls on one knee, but that doesn't also guarantee that they would have gotten to that ball with two knees. Yeah. It's a bigger move and some balls, there's a certain area of the plate where it's a highest percentage of probability for block. Right. The balls that catchers miss out to the side, they go off their chest protector this way and they go down up the first or third baseline. Those are low probability blocks. Yeah. Those are going to be much more, now you say, now the, the, the picking game is much more of a thing um, behind the plate nowadays because as I say with catchers that I work all the time, you're an infielder with gear. As a catcher, you need to be very, very athletic, very, very, uh, you know, mobile and stable and being able to field your position well, that's why you, the shortstop's usually the best, the best, best athlete on the field. And if you can mimic a lot of the movements and mentalities that the shortstop has behind the plate, it's going to make you a better catcher. Right. So um, how I would respond to those people is that explore the realms of going down into a one knee stance, because not only that, but when you get into college and when you get into the upper levels, they're going to be requiring you to use those stances anyways just because mm -hmm. the best players in the game that win gold gloves every single year they're predominantly from that stance so it, it has nothing to do with missing balls there's this is where the metric side of the game comes in just because they missed the ball it's not because they were up on two knees yeah. it has to be you know where is the ball what is the spin you know there's a ton of factors that can go into it but as a catcher, when it comes to missing balls, it doesn't matter out of what stance you're in, it comes from you knowing the pitcher on the mound mm -hmm. and you knowing the spin that the ball is going to have coming off the dirt, you anticipating and you being ready for worst case scenario. Worst case scenario, I know that this guy likes to spike his slider way over here because he yep. throws it extremely hard. Yep. I need to be ready for that. So I need to be up on my toes and I need to get my body in a good position to where I can make that kind of move. Yep. Um, and in my opinion, that comes from I've always been more of a mobile person, so the one knee just fit for me. So. Yeah, I actually saw somebody on Twitter posted a chart, and they I, there was a back and forth about where they got the metrics, but they've said that there's been less pass balls with one knee than there has been with two, and that most of the pass balls that people will use as an example are balls that pitchers just yank anyway. Yep. They're not, yep. like you said, probably wouldn't have blocked it with two knees, nope. but the fact that they're not on two knees, people can say, yes. oh, well, he would have blocked that if he – but in reality, a guy that throws a 99 mile hour cutter or yes. something like, there's not much you can do about it anyway, and and that's more on the pitcher than it is on the catcher anyway. It's just more of a new school versus old school debate on style. We're not talking about you know, we're talking about the style of catching. Just like there's style of hitters, there's a certain way they move right. their bat. This is a certain style of catching. However, that doesn't mean just because they miss a the ball and you grew up in an era where no one was on a knee and it was told to be bad. Um, that's not necessarily, that doesn't translate to lower stats in whatever realm. And that, as you said, even higher stats and better, uh, just because all because you're putting your body in a better position to both throw out of, block out of, and receive out of. Yeah, so. And you're saying stealing those strikes, the extra strikes that you would get from the bottom of the yes. zone would allow you to have an advantage over top of where you'd be anyway. Yes. Yeah. You're a catcher. You didn't start that way. You started at a different position and basically had to learn one of the most difficult positions, if not the most difficult position in baseball. So with you developing so much defensively as a catcher and last year ranking so high in minor league baseball in the catching metrics, it's great to get a, get your perspective on this because there's a few hot topics in catching. A lot of talk on Twitter. Um, local coaches here, I think, disagree on the way catching is because a lot of them weren't catchers. Like myself, I wasn't a catcher. I've had to learn from people like you. So... Why are more catchers, just basic question here, best answer you can, I know you get this a lot, but why are more catchers going to one knee down versus two knees? And what do you say to coaches who are asking catchers to avoid one knee down? Yeah, I would say that it is not in their best interest to just go to a traditional two knee up old school stance and more explore the, the realms of a one knee stance. Because number one, it makes you more athletic. Number two, you want to be in the best position that you can receive, block, and throw from, and that is the one knee stance. People, you, you see it all the time on TV. 
people are going to one knee, it allows you to get underneath the ball to present it to the umpire better. Um, there are some people that are on TV that still are in the traditional style. However, you see them, Kyle Higashioka is a name that I think of that has traditionally been um, a traditional style catcher. And now he's moving more towards the one knee. I saw him in the playoffs this year. He's moving towards more one knee. Uh, you know, just because receiving is such a big part of the game nowadays, being able to, to steal strikes for your pitcher and turn 1-1 one, one counts into 1-2 counts, uh, you know, the offensive numbers go dra dramatically downward um, just by gaining one strike in the count. And I think as a catcher, you know, your number one priority should be to help out the pitcher and do anything you can on the mound for their success. So I think um, I turn that around and what is the best position I can be in to help the pitcher on the mound have the most success possible. Now on the flip side, I know people are going to say, well, you see catchers miss balls all the time on one knee. Okay. Yes, they do miss balls on one knee, but that doesn't also guarantee that they would have gotten to that ball with two knees. Yeah. It's a bigger move. And some balls, there's a certain area of the plate where it's a highest percentage of probability for block. Right. The balls that catchers miss out to the side, they go off their chest protector this way and they go down up the first or third baseline. Those are low probability blocks. Yeah. Those are going to be much more, now you say, now the, the, the picking game is much more of a thing um, behind the plate nowadays because as I say with catchers that I work all the time, you're an infielder with gear. As a catcher, you need to be very, very athletic, very, very uh, you know, mobile and stable and being able to field your position well. That's why you, the shortstop's usually the, best, the best, best athlete on the field and if you can mimic a lot of the movements and mentalities that the shortstop has behind the plate, it's gonna make you a better catcher. Right. So um, how I would respond to those people is that explore the realms of going down into a one knee stance because not only that but when you get into college and you get into the upper levels they're going to be requiring you to use those stances anyways just because mm -hmm. the best players in the game that win gold gloves every single year they're predominantly from that stance so it, it has nothing to do with missing balls there's this is where the metric side of the game comes in just because they missed the ball it's not because they were up on two knees yeah. it has to be you know where is the ball? What is the spin? You know, there's a ton of factors that can go into it. But as a catcher, when it comes to missing balls, it doesn't matter what, what stance you're in. It comes from you knowing the pitcher on the mound mm -hmm. and you knowing the spin that the ball is going to have coming off the dirt. You anticipating and you being ready for worst case scenario. Worst case scenario, I know that this guy likes to spike his slider way over here because he yeah. throws it extremely hard. Yeah. I need to be ready for that. So I need to be up on my toes and I need to get my body in a good position to where I can make that kind of move. Yep. Um, and in my opinion, that comes from, I've always been more of a mobile person. So the one knee just fit for me. So. Yeah. I actually saw somebody on Twitter posted a chart and they, I, there was a back and forth about where they got the metrics, but they've said that there's been less pass balls with one knee than there has been with two. And that most of the pass balls that people will use as an example are balls that pitchers just yank anyway. Yep. They're not, yep. like you said, probably wouldn't have blocked it with two knees. Nope. But the fact that they're not on two knees, people can say, yes. oh, well, he would have blocked that if he, but in reality, a guy that throws a 99 mile hour cutter or yes. something like, there's not much you can do about it anyway. And, and that's more on the pitcher than it is on the catcher anyway. It's just more of a new school versus old school debate on style. We're not talking about, you know, we're talking about the style of catching, just like there's style of hitters. There's a certain way they move right. their bat. This is a certain style of catching. However, that doesn't mean just because they miss a the ball and you grew up in an era where no one was on a knee and it was told to be bad, um, that's not necessarily, that doesn't translate to lower stats in, in whatever realm. And as you said, even higher stats and better, uh, just because all because you're putting your body in a better position to both throw out of, block out of and receive out of. Yeah, so. And you're saying stealing those strikes, the extra strikes that you would get from the bottom of the yes. zone would allow you to have an advantage over top of where you'd be anyway. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so another uh, thing that I didn't know, and again, if I had caught, I probably wouldn't have known. I think that it's relatively new, but you see a lot of kids all the way down to nine years old doing it at tournaments is loading your glove before the pitch. Mm -hmm. So you have some coaches who want a target Pitching coaches specifically who, who want their pitchers to be able to see a target. I know as a pitcher, um, when I was younger, I would want to see a target. But obviously knowing now what I know, I'd just rather the catcher catch the ball better and, and steal more strikes and be in a better position to receive. So what, in your opinion, does loading your glove actually do? And again, 
for the critic of loading your glove, what would you say to that person? Yeah, I, I, again, I think glove load, again, goes back to more on style and how that style is fits, fitting for that person. I think that a glove load's important. Glove load is adding athleticism, it's adding rhythm. If I was, if I we were both lining up to sprint and I was not moving, and you had a 10 yard head start, who's gonna win that race? That's the same concept as a glove load. Now, does the glove load need to be to the ground? No, that is more up for the exploration process of knowing you know, what can the individual and the catcher handle, what makes sense to his brain and what works for him. A lot of it's gonna be game feedback. If I'm doing a certain move, it doesn't matter if I think the move is a certain way correctly and you can't execute that in the game. Right. Number one, you haven't repped it out enough Yep. And number two, the umpire is just not calling strikes because it doesn't matter how good your move is. If the umpire is not calling it, an adjustment needs to be made. Yeah. So I think that I think that to a person that says the glove loads aren't bad, I would say it's all dependent upon the individual. And is, is the person that is training them, have they done it? And can they explain it correctly? Because there's a big difference in being able to explain something correctly and being able to explain something when you've done it. And I think that if you've done it and you've done it at a high level or if you have talked to someone that has given you certain verbiage that has done it at a high level, I think that those can be extremely impactful. Uh, I, I, I am a, I'm a huge fan of the glove load. I do it in my own game, but over the years, I've, this, I'm going to my fourth year in pro ball now, even since college, I have had a major um, – the progression has been wide as far as the different glove loads that I've had mm -hmm. and what's allowed for some different successes for myself. So I think the, the, the most important part in saying all that is just, are you in a good position and are you getting underneath the baseball and moving it one direction back to the zone? I think that's something that a little kid should be able to focus on, getting a good target from the beginning, because uh, that's important for the pitcher to have a good visual. And then Am I getting my glove load underneath the ball by the time the, the pitcher releases the ball? And then am I moving the ball back towards the zone in one motion, not a herky? Do you see a lot of catchers do a herky-jerky motion? The reason why their glove dunks like that is because they're above the ball and they're trying to get under the ball and they don't have leverage. They haven't created stability and they haven't created leverage in their positioning and mm -hmm. in their setup. So, again, I say positioning and setup a lot is because that is essential to everything that you're doing. Um, so focus on the positioning, focus on getting underneath the ball, and focus on clean, smooth moves back to the zone. I feel like that's something, you know, when I work with kids and when I um, explain stuff to people, I feel like those are the most simplistic things that you can do until you get under the help of someone uh, that is a catching coach and that has done it at a mm -hmm. high level that can get into the specifics. So Yeah, I think it, in every level is a little different. I think when you're talking about a 9-year-old kid or a 12-year-old kid or a 14-year-old kid, I think the games are – at those levels are all different. And right. They, the, the level of pitcher is different. The level of base runner is different. The distances are different. Oh, there's a lot of variables that are different there, but I think what you're saying is great because you you can change the way that you do it. It doesn't mean you can't load your glove. It just means to the level that which you load your gloves. Correct. And I like that you said where a lot of people miss out on is that Instagram or TikTok or something that a dad sees, they say, hey, this is important for you to do and you should do it but they've never repped it out. Correct. And so it's like, you got to, just like anything else, you should be able to rep it out before you go into a game with it. Your practice should be 99%. Your game should be the 1% and making sure that you're comfortable and confident before you go in. Um, I think that's, that's, that's huge. Um, going from that, bridging into how a young catcher can develop. When a dad is saying, hey, let's go work on catching or a coach says, hey, catchers, come over here and let's work on catching. I don't think they know exactly what that means outside of just feeding a ball in the machine. So how much time would you devote to receiving versus blocking versus throwing to bases versus talking about game calling? Um, how would you break that up? Um, I think being an infielder helped me make the transition to catching more smoothly. You see a lot of guys in the past that, you know, like Buster Posey instance mm -hmm. or, you know, people that have played infield and then transfer to catching. It's much easier because you've been using your hands, you've had soft hands, you know, your movements are fluid. You're becoming an athlete. Like finding drills to do that cater to the needs that you have defensively as a player is, is very much a priority. But I think also as much of a priority is understanding the game of baseball, understanding the plays that are going to be happening here and where you need to be and where other people need to be. Mm -hmm. I think just knowing the game of baseball, having a good baseball IQ, being a student of the game, I think that those things trump 
you know, you can do all the drill work you want, yeah. but if you're not vocal on the field and if you're not, you know, yeah. being a leader, especially at the younger ages when no one really knows what's going on, yeah. um, I think that's much more impactful to learn and you'll get yourself on the eyes of, you know, college radar because mm -hmm. coaches want people that they come into the program and be a leader and be a leader out in the field and, you know, be the quarterback of the defense, so to speak. And catching is about relationships, you know. Having, does the person on the mound trust you 100% with the fingers that I'm putting down, with, the, you know, the, the calls that I'm making? Does the inf are you on the same page with the infield? Are you the leader of the infield? Are you lead the leader of the field? Are you a vocal person? You know, are you, are you, do you have a good relationship with the manager? Are you calling the correct plays when the time asks for in bunt defenses and first and third defenses right. um, and pick plays? Mm -hmm. um, we've probably both seen kids that we work with that, are really good with drills and then they get into a, yes. an unknown game in, environment and they're kind of like a fish out of water yes so i think that's great and that's where that's how we grew up i mean we grew up playing wiffle ball and i think having more baseball plays versus um you know as much as i like having a controlled setting in here i do think that that has become a lot of the ways that kids practice now where they let's go to the batting cage versus uh pick up baseball isn't just not a thing anymore like yep. you have to have a tournament entry fee just to play baseball you can't just put a uniform on and go show up at the field and play with your buddies. Yep. So there's less of uh, unstructured play and learning. Uh, and just like that baseball situation has never happened before because I've just not played the game enough. Right. When we were younger, there was a lot of rundowns. There was a lot yep. of you had to back up a base because you just figured out that that didn't work versus yep. the coach telling you that. So definitely wish that there was a little bit more unstructured play. And I think that's great for all positions, not just catchers, what you yep. said of trying to learn the game first and then you know then you can add the structure probably yeah. later in another thing i can add on to that i see that kids nowadays are just not as you know tough as as it, as it used to be when we grew up we did something wrong we're running if we weren't listening we're running it's the constant i i just boil it all down to attention to detail you know if i do something and i have more attention to detail i can do it less times than you and be in a much better position because I've paid attention to the things that I'm trying to do right. and feel. I think that needs to be an aspect that's taken into a practice environment, you know, and I think the kids are going to get way better. They need to be held accountable by their coaches. If they are doing something incorrectly and they're not listening and they're not following through with that, that's going to show up in the game. So they need to understand that something needs to happen, uh, whether it's, you know, running or push-ups. It needs to be, it needs to be something to where there is like a cost. Like what is my, if I do this, my team is going to suffer. So if I do this in practice, I need to figure out that, you know, translate the physical to the mental. I need to be better. I need to be paying attention to the details so I can have and do these things at a higher success, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that I think that that needs to be much bigger of an emphasis. It has nothing to do with yelling at your kids. It's holding your kids accountable yeah, to a standard. Why. Understanding to understand why. Yeah. 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 That's good. Okay. <clears throat> So a lot of parents are wondering, they're hearing advice, they're saying, okay, you know, some of them are gonna say, I like what you're saying, but we still don't have a clear picture of what's going on. There's so much information out there. It's so hard for them to figure out actually, you know, what to do and the steps they need to take. The showcases we talked about, travel teams we've talked about, but you know, there's so much noise from perfect game or from social media that are getting fed to them that the message that sometimes I give, or maybe you'll give, or another player who is, who is seeing what professional baseball and college baseball looks like, it gets drowned out. So I really would like the parents who are watching this or maybe parents that aren't in our community that will stumble upon the video to understand what the recruiting process looks like now because you've gone through it and also maybe what the professional scouting process looks like. Uh, what advice would you give to them as they're about to go through it to give them their best chance of achieving their goals? Yeah. I would say, I would say in a college setting, I would say it's very important to understand. I think there also is a huge upside to a perfect game showcase. I just view it very differently. Now, a perfect game showcase should be used as a baseline. These, I'm going to a perfect game showcase to figure out what is my time in this? What is my velocity in this? How do I stack up against the surrounding competition, surrounding state? Then you take that knowledge and you go apply it in an off season of work. I need to throw 10 miles an hour harder. How am I gonna do that? It's not by playing more games, it's by getting in the weight room 
and focusing on you know all the deficiencies that I have as a baseball player and as an athlete. Mm -hmm. I think that you focusing on being a better athlete and a better person and getting involved in the weight room and you know getting involved in more sprinting and more agility and doing stuff like that, the results you're going to get from that are going to be much more attractive to college coaches. They're looking for someone that is going to be an athlete and that's going to be a good person and has a strong mentality that they can develop in the future over the next three to four years if they're in that program. Yep. So I think that for me, it was a, it was a, it was a different transition. I had to learn in a completely different position. I had to go and I had to go to junior college for two years, figure out how to catch and then got an opportunity to play at UCF and then COVID year ended that season. And then I got drafted in 21 after a good season. And, you know, I feel like, the biggest, piece, the biggest piece for me is finding out what hard work is like and finding out what I need to do to get better. Like I said, be a sponge for information. If you're around professional players, ask them any questions that you may have. If you have around former, former players and, or former professional coaches, ask them their opinion. I, who I am today is a result of all the people that I've ran into over the years and asked questions, and I take a little piece from them, a little piece from them, a little piece from them, mm -hmm. and make it into myself because not anything that one person says is the way to go. Right. Um, so I think in a college aspect, you want to be extremely attractive. You want to have tools to develop. So if you need to work on getting your bat speed better, if you need to work on driving the ball with more power, if you need to work on creating more barrel accuracy and not striding out, striking out as much, if you want to work on getting on base more and having a better eye at the plate, then you need to get on a machine and you need to, you know, face stuff that you're going to face on a machine, which is going to be harder than the game, which will help translate to the game. Um, I, I, I feel like I feel like making an off season full of stuff that you're not good at will spend dividends and make you into a completely new player that following season, which you know may intrigue the the interests of you know college programs and you moving on to the next level. The second piece to that is also making sure you are involved in a well known travel program that has. Um, you know, that has connections, that is notorious. Yeah, real, real connections. <laughs> real connection that is notorious for moving players on to the next level because yeah. baseball nowadays more than ever is a connection sport. Do I, just because you are the best player in an area, it could be the middle of nowhere and no one knows about you. It doesn't matter how good you are. If no one knows about you and people aren't fo footing the bill for you and making, you know, making the phone calls that need to be necessary mm -hmm. and have those contacts that will yeah. pick up their call, you may get pushed to the side by someone that is not as talented but has better connections. So I feel like getting involved into travel baseball programs that have good connections and have quality reputations of developing players is essential because that's what's going to allow college coaches to pick up the phone and they call and say, yeah. you know, hey, I got a guy for you. Are they going to answer that phone call and are they going to believe them based upon past stuff that they've sent them? So I feel like, you know, getting involved in a quality travel program will only help speed up the process not only on the competition side of things you're going to be playing against much better competition but also you're going to have access to much better contacts mm -hmm. so before that's part b part a is you need to be the athlete and be the baseball player that's going to be attractive to colleges and then part b is you need to be involved in a travel team and be in the circle of people right. that are going to pick up phone calls you know when you're interested in this college and and, and you need a recommendation so there, there's so many kids who um they go to showcases and they probably don't even know what their miles per hour is. They don't know what their 60 time is. They don't know how far they jump. They don't know how high they jump. They don't know anything about themselves. And that's the problem is you're saying, these are things that are important that colleges may look at or, you know, are a guy that runs a 6.5, that's very, very good. But you run a 7.3, what are you gonna do about it? Yep. Like That's what colleges are looking for and you don't run it. So you're saying you have to have a, uh, and that, and that's that's what I'm passionate about. Obviously, is that there's a lot of kids that just have no plan. They have no understanding first of assessing where they are. They have to have a good assessment process. They don't have that. Okay, now we've assessed and we're not good at these things. Now we need to attack those things. How are we going to do that? We have to have a great plan. We have to have a good uh, somebody who knows what they're doing on getting you faster, on getting your bat speed better. Uh, and that, you know, it doesn't need to be difficult things, but it's attacking those things that you're talking about. Yep. And then part B, like you said, there's a lot of college, co you know, kids that I'm sending to places that I, the, the, the travel organizations say that they're going to do this, this, and this. And then you look at their track record, they really haven't sent anybody anywhere. So that's the thing to be aware of as parents is 
look at the track record of the coaches that you're sending these kids to. Uh, like you're saying, also, some of these coaches are better than others at establishing, you know, I, I know one guy off the top of my head who it seems like every time that he said he's going to do something, that's what he's done. And that's important to me. And that's the person that I'm going to recommend. But you got to do your homework as a parent. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of wild west out there where people are, are slinging around that they know this person, they know this person, or, you know, this person's attached to our travel program. He was a 10 year big leaguer. Well, is that person really coaching? And then is that person making a phone call for you? And those are the things to be aware of. Um, it's hard for parents to know, but I'm glad that we were able to at least cover some of these questions. I think in the future, uh, we'll have more people answer questions. We'll have more questions for you. I think this is a great start and it's a good opportunity. I hope parents listen to it. I appreciate you taking the time to, to go through this stuff um, because again, you're one of the hardest working people I've ever seen in my whole life. Um, no question on that. Like you're, you're definitely the type of person who will hit to your hands bleed kind of person. Uh, you'll go the extra distance further than anybody else will. So I really hope the kids who are, you know, have that dream of going to college or maybe even beyond that, want to be a major league baseball player, I hope that their ears are open and I hope the parents will will take the time to really pay yeah. attention to this. Sure. Yep.